All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for our first YouTube live. Um, this is going to be a little, a little bit um, janky, as my, my staff would put it, for a little while. Um, but I've gotten a lot of questions posed to me for our online forum. Um, hopefully, we're going to be doing more of these sessions down the line. So I'm just going to put into the chat uh, where you can ask questions of me in the future if, say, you aren't able to attend live or if you have something that comes up later that you would like to learn more about. So like I said, I had a bunch of questions that were submitted online. And for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Dr. Jesse Sanders. I'm the owner and chief veterinarian of Aquatic Veterinary Services. We are a mobile veterinary practice that serves only aquatic pets in California and Nevada. And thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. I wore my most festive fish holiday sweater. So I hope you're all having a lovely holiday and are looking forward to the new year. So to get to our questions. Um, so the question that was asked very frequently, um, both that was submitted and my clients asked me is, how did I end up a fish vet? So I was one of those obnoxious kids who always knew I wanted to be a veterinarian. Now, this is from when I was very young. We grew up in a rural town in Connecticut. And the only vets I was really aware of were small animal veterinarians for, you know, traditional cat and dog and horse veterinarians. Um, even though I lived in a town that had a ton of dairy cows, it didn't really cross my mind that, you know, we need to have production veterinarians. So again, that kind of ties into what we have with aquaculture these days. So when I was very young, knew I wanted to be a veterinarian. So, you know, taking all the biology classes that you have to, I went for my veterinary assistant certificate when I was 16 and technically really not allowed to handle hazardous weights or any sharp implements. Um, and then I got to sit in on a couple surgeries. So just, you know, regular spay neuters and come to find out I didn't have a good reaction to the sight of blood, or at least that's what I thought at the time. Um, I actually have just really low blood pressure, which if you're standing around, you know, with your legs locked for a long period of time, um, can actually cause you to get faint and pass out. So that's actually why I was fainting during surgery. It wasn't really because of the blood at all. But due to that reaction, I kind of got off the vet path and moved over towards a career in marine biology. So like veterinary medicine and taking care of animals, I loved the ocean and I loved going to the aquarium. So growing up in Connecticut, our closest aquarium was Mystic Aquarium, way all the way down. It was about an hour drive from my the house where I grew up, but I loved going there as much as I could. You know, any Christmas present, birthday trip, like let's let's go to the aquarium. So again, that kind of tied into, okay, well, maybe I'll end up, you know, doing a master's in marine biology, studying something, doing research, and ended up at the University of Rhode Island, which is renowned for their marine biology program. And during that time, um, I had the very wonderful uh, time to go volunteer for Mystic Aquarium. So thankfully, the school I chose for undergrad was very close to the aquarium. And I started going in one afternoon a week. I, you know, kind of wanted to get on the whale team. I'm a little embarrassed to say. Everybody wants to be a marine mammal trainer. It's just what a lot of people go for. So got, you know, on the wait list for the whale team, but they're like, if you start in fish and inverts, like we're more likely to get you into one of those whale rotations faster. So I started at fish and invertebrates and was the obnoxious student that volunteered that would show up during everybody's lunchtime. So they had to figure out something to do with me that, you know, would keep me out of trouble being a brand new volunteer that if I screwed up, you know, wasn't going to be a big deal. So they put me in charge of cleaning the backup octopus tent tank. So in big aquariums, they have certain exhibits that, you know, kind of need to have something in them all the time. So at Mystic, we had a backup electric eel. His name was Henry. And we had a backup 
octopus whose name was Squirt. So Squid was the octopus out on exhibit, but Squirt was in the back just in case Squid got sick or, you know, was going through something. They could swap out the critters and, you know, none of the public would be the wiser. So in his backup tank, basically you have this really big gravel site. I'm like, I'm talking <laughs> really, really big. And I just go through and you know, if you've ever gravel siphoned any aquarium, it's about the same. You just go through and, you know, gently pick up the gravel, put it down. All the debris starts pulling up. And little Squirt, who he was about two feet across at this point, would just ride around on the gravel siphon with me. And while everyone was eating their lunch, I'd just sit there and siphon out the tank, fill it back up with salt water and basically stay out of trouble. And I loved working with Squirt. I loved doing food prep, feeding the cow nose rays. I even was one of those weird people who liked skimming the gunk off the top of jellyfish tanks, which, you know, you're never going to think of actually doing unless you work in a big aquarium. So I annoyed their staff to no end and wanted to learn more about how these animals were taken care of. You know, especially in a big public aquarium, you have access to thousands of species that are, are pretty rare sometimes for the home aquarist. So got to, again, annoy their staff to no end. And when I'd kind of tapped them out, and this was after two summer internships and almost 1,500 volunteer hours, they recommended that I go talk to the vet staff. And again, this was kind of trotting on the path of, well, you know, I might not be the best vet if I can't handle blood. But in talking to Dr. Tuttle, she's still there, Dr. Allison Tuttle, and the interns that went through there. So I've had the unique opportunity of seeing many of their interns when I was a volunteer who are now my colleagues, um, Dr. Inga, Dr. Kara, Dr. Jen. Annoying them to no end really kind of put me on the path to veterinary school again. However, I was in my last year of college and really had to get my act together in order to get into veterinary school. So I was able to sneak in, barely, I got waitlisted at Tufts um, and then was it later accepted, probably because I was the one weird fish kid. Um, and therefore I was, you know, accepted to vet school and did all the normal vet things, cats, dogs, pig, sheep, horses, goats, and cows, and then tried to do fish on the side. Well, unfortunately, there are some vet schools that really don't have a lot of fish programs or any aquatics whatsoever. At Tufts, we had two hours of fish and four hours of marine mammals. And, you know, the job discrepancy between the two is, you know, kind of pushed the other way. So that's really the only didactic learning that I got in vet school about fish. So coming up on my last year, um, when you do all your clinical rotations, so you have small animal medicine, large animal medicine, anesthesia, surgery, uh, wildlife center that we had. So I took all of the time that we didn't have to be on campus and went elsewhere. So I got to go back to Mystic, this time as a veterinary extern. So, you know, you get to do a little bit more as you kind of go up the chart there. So got to go back and work with all my friends, which was awesome. Got to learn a little bit more about their animal care, especially the mammal side of things, which I really wasn't exposed to much before. I got to go to SeaWorld in Orlando. And basically, if you tell them you want to work with fish, A, they're going to think you're crazy. And B, you're going to let them, you're, they're going to let you do all the fish stuff pretty much by yourself. They love their mammals to no end. It's just fine. I just, you know, rather than playing with, you know, a manatee that was rescued, I'd rather go feed a giant leopard stingray that was about six feet across. So didn't quite fit the, you know, normal SeaWorld extern guide and got, you know, kind of written up on my evaluation is did not seem to show interest in the mammals, but it is what it is. Um, I also had the wonderful opportunity to go visit Dr. Helen Sweeney at her practice in upstate New York. So Dr. Sweeney was the pet fish lecturer at a program called Aquavet. So this is a summer program that's run out of Cornell and it's four weeks it's very intense. You go through invertebrates, fish, all the way through marine mammals. And we had a surgery lab 
where I believe it was, we had two, one or two black bass for 16 students where we did a surgery to remove their spleen. So, you know, you put the fish out with anesthesia and we'll be talking about that. There was another question on surgery, which we'll be answering soon. Um, so, you know, knocking the fish out, putting them up on the surgery table, same as you would a cat or a dog just for a fish. And just the way that she presented herself and walked us through the surgery was a little bit awe-inspiring. And for Tufts, in order to graduate, you had to go out and do two weeks of private practice, you know, in your clinical rotations. So I asked Dr. Sweeney if I could come up and shadow her. She has to, still to this day, a small animal exotics and fish clinic out of Buffalo, New York, of all places. So if you've been paying attention to the news, currently Buffalo, New York is under several feet of snow, but this, this isn't anything weird. Um, and if you can sustain a fish practice out there, you know, there's good potential for fish practices elsewhere. So being up with Dr. Sweeney was two of the chillest, most, you know, awe-inspiring and confidence-building weeks that I had received in my veterinary career to that point. So rather than being an aquarium vet, which unfortunately the positions are few and far between, they're highly competitive. And usually you're gonna end up as an intern or a resident. Um, if you do private practice, you don't have to do any of that. So after spending time with Dr. Sweeney, I knew that's, that's where I was gonna end up was in private practice. So as soon as I graduated from veterinary school and you can do this in vet medicine, but not in human medicine, I moved out to California and started interviewing at some local clinics. You know, just if I can do small animal, or large animal, there was some mixed animal practices. I can add fish on as well, and you know, improve your revenue, improve your client base, but nobody was really interested. So ended up starting my own practice, Aquatic Veterinary Services, that in a couple of days is gonna be 10 years old. So we are currently one of the most profitable and most um, long lived, Long, we have the longest longevity of any aquatic practice currently out there. So that is the very long version of how I became an aquatic veterinarian. So I see we have some questions coming in. Um, I'm gonna do two more of the ones that were already submitted and then I'll get to the questions that are currently going up in the chat. So I covered this a little bit, but Bob C asked, what training is required to be a fish vet? So again, a little bit like I kind of went through in my story, um, you need to be a vet, which again, there's not that many veterinary schools in the country. I believe we're at 35 or 40. Um, there are some international ones as well. And again, you're gonna receive the same training, but you gotta pass the NAVLI or the North America Veterinary Exam. I forget what the L stands for. Um, and then once you're licensed, you can go practice pretty much anywhere. Um, my sister is a human doctor and in human medicine, you're required to do an internship. And then if you wanna specialize a residency and depending on what field you wanna go into, you might be spending two to five years or like my sister who's a surgeon, you might be doing seven. So vet med is not like that at all. Um, but when it comes to fish specifically, like I said, Tufts does not have the greatest aquatic program still to this day. If you want a good aquatic program, you want to look at Florida, North Carolina, Cornell, or Davis. Those are really the current programs that have the strongest aquatic program. Michigan will hopefully be on that list soon. Um, one of my great colleagues, Dr. Myron Kevis, uh, just accepted a position there. So hopefully he'll be boosting the fishy stuff coming out of Michigan. Um, Dr. Tom Locke has been there as well. Um, not a veterinarian, but he is doing a lot of research, which has a lot of opportunities for veterinarians to get involved with. So again, when it comes to fish, you have your options of doing internships at aquariums. Usually, again, they're very competitive. So you have to usually do an internship, either a small animal or large animal for a year, and then go to an aquarium or a zoo for a year. And then if you want to do a residency, so right now, the only boarded specialty is in zoo medicine with a sub-focus in aquatics. 
Now, next year, for the first time ever, the American Association of Fish Veterinarians has actually put together a fish board specialty. Everything is moving along as it should be. Um, I'm on the committee that's currently organizing that, but hopefully by the end of next year, we will have our four, first board certified fish veterinarians. And yes, I will absolutely be taking that test for the holiday here. I actually received a lot of textbooks that I'm going to need to study for getting my board certification, um, but you're not required to do that. Um, there's also the certified aquatic veterinarian position. This is a certificate that is offered through WAVMA or the World Aquatic Veterinary Medical Association. Basically, you just prove that you've done, I believe it's 500 hours in nine different knowledge and experience categories, and that will get you the certificate. So the board is kind of a little bit more specialized because you actually have to take a test and prove that you retain something that you learned. And then um, Barbara Kay asks, what jobs are available for fish vets? So we're actually going to be offering a free program coming up, and I should definitely put that in the chat as well. Um, starting mid-January, we will have an 11-week course in careers in aquatic veterinary medicine. So obviously we have pet fish. That's what I, you, that's what I do. Um, I will not be speaking. Um, my great colleague, Dr. Briney, she's out of London with the London Aquatic Veterinary Practice. She will be speaking about pet fish. And then we have aquaculture, zebrafish. We have um, a zoo and aquarium vet that went through the whole residency program and then one that didn't. So again, you don't have to be a resident, go through that residency program to get into an aquariums. So there's a couple different paths. We have marine mammal conservation. We have aquatic pathologist. We have a NOAA representative, so working for the federal government. We have invertebrate and uh, state veterinary medicine, you know, another federal program, uh, not federal, state regulatory program, and aquaculture. And I think I'm probably missing a couple. Like I said, there's 11, so it's going to be tw uh, 12 weeks. We have one week off when we're actually celebrating our 10th anniversary. I'm taking my staff to the aquarium. Um, but there are a lot of different positions if you're interested in aquatic veterinary medicine. And me doing pet fish is, we, we had a discussion about this at the last Aquatic Veterinary Medicine Committee for the AVMA, is a sub, is a, is a let's see, it's a minority, minority, minority niche. So within, you know, the vet careers, aquatics is a sub niche and then pet fish is the sub niche of that. And then working exclusively in pet fish is a sub, sub, sub niche. Aquaculture is really the position that is going to have the most potential growth. So we're starting with Dr. Nora Hickey. She is working for um, tribal conservation out of Washington state. Um, she is currently the president of the American Association of Fish Veterinarians, at least for the next four days. And then my wonderful colleague, Dr. Ashley Emanuel, who is also a pet fish veterinarian, will be taking over for her. Okay, so let's get to the chat. Um, we are asking about pH in a beta tank. So for this particular tank, unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be a ton of information. Um, if that person is still on here, if you're able to tell me how big the tank is and what else is in the tank with him. Um, I will definitely get back to your question. So if whoever is on here is interested in giving me, you know, how big your tank is and how many fish are in there, that will kind of tell me if your KH is about right. Um, if you have specific questions about your tank or diet, um, we do offer um, online consultations with me um, or one of our other uh, certified aquatic veterinarians. Um, Dr. Christina Dover currently works for us out of Southern California. But if you have any specific questions, we do offer online consultations. Um, basically, you'll have me at your disposal for full 15 minutes. You can ask me anything you want. It does not come with any treatment or diagnosis because obviously just given the limitations of telehealth, we I don't, I don't want to give you half the story. So, okay. So we have a five gallon tank that has six plants, six plants, and one fish. So question is the cage changes about after about five drops. So yes, these lovely test kits. Um, I'm assuming this is an API one, which unfortunately goes in a scale of DKH. So for every drop, 
is the equivalent of 17.1 milligrams per liter. Yeah, I know. Fun, fun math. So if you're at five, oh goodness, I'm going to do my 17 times table. Um, your KH is going to be about 85, which for one fish being in the tank is probably okay. Now, however, with those plants that are in there, so during, you know, daylight hours, plants are photosynthesizing, taking carbon dioxide, turning it into oxygen, all good, happy. However, when the lights go off, um, obviously plants still need to stay alive. So they're gonna switch from photosynthesis to cellular respiration. So unfortunately that reverses the equation, taking oxygen and converting it into carbon dioxide. And if you have a lot of plants that are struggling to survive, obviously that could potentially be dropping the pH. Um, really the best way to know for sure is to take your pH and KH readings before the lights come on, before any lights hit your tank in the morning, and before the lights go down at night. So that's really going to be the best indicator because unfortunately not all aquarium plants are going to react to the same and have the same oxygen use. So it'd be a really good idea to take those readings, you know, first thing in the morning before there's any lights, when, you know, the respiration has kind of hit its peak before the lights come on and photosynthesis gets rid of everything. And then, you know, after the day is almost done, plants are getting ready to switch to respiration. Um, take your pH and KH readings again and see how much a difference you have with that. Your KH might change a little bit. It should drop, you know, before the lights come on as respiration is going on. It should drop a little bit, but your pH should stay the same. Because again, remember our KH or carbon alkalinity contains all the buffers that keep our pH stable. So as long as your KH is sufficient enough to keep your pH stable, and we're talking pH stability within 0.5 of the two different levels, um, that should be sufficient where your tank doesn't need any extra buffers. Again, I wish I had, you know, more specific <laughs> ideas for, you know, if you have this many plants, but again, all plants just don't act the same. So hopefully that helps if you're able to take the reading, you know, before the lights come on in the morning, and then at the end of the day, before the lights go out, that's going to be the best judge of your particular tank and how well the pH is stable. So hopefully that answers your question. All right, moving on to some of our other submitted questions. So this is from Julie G. How do you do surgery on a fish? So yes, if you're completely new to, you know, the fish veterinary world, you can absolutely do surgery on a fish. Same as you would a cat or a dog, but obviously your fish is a little bit different anesthetic and anatomy wise. So with cats and dogs, we use um, aerosolized anesthetic. So isoflurane, sevoflurane, halothane, if you're really old school, um, so, you know, you put it into their lungs, the animals breathe it in, it gets taken up into the bloodstream, and they're sleepy that way. Obviously, for a fish, they're going to be underwater. So we have a powder anesthetic that we mix in with the water with the fish. And this is how I do most of my standard exams. Uh, excuse me. You usually at a lower level. So I use a powder called MS222, also known as tricane or finquel. Uh, it's been used in fish farming for decades. It's very safe, it's very reversible, and it is approved for use in all fish by the FDA. So it's one of the few approved drugs that we actually have. Um, again, I've been using it since I started 10 years ago. Um, some veterinarians who don't do you know, fish surgery regularly, you can use eugenol or clove oil. Tends to have a little bit longer lasting effects. Um, it isn't oil, so just the general properties, it kind of sticks to the gills a little bit, um, but will work, you know, in a pinch if you don't have access to any, any MS222. So this is a benzocaine derivative that is also kind of a respiratory depressant. So the fish, you know, lose consciousness, and as they're getting anesthetized in their, you know, little exam bucket, um, they're gonna sign up, fall on their side, and then flip upside down. So for our normal exams, I'm not giving them that much of the drugs. Um, we have a standard dose we use. Some fish are lightweight. Some fish need more. It's just an individual preference. But 
to do an exam on a fish. Obviously, they think I'm about to eat them, regardless of their size. And they are big, wet, slippery torpedoes. So it's very hard to restrain them like a cat or a dog where, you know, have some skin, have some fur to kind of hang on to. For a fish, we don't, we don't have any of that. So chemical sedation all the way. But for surgery, if we increase the dose, we can actually, you know, put them in the same anesthetic plane that you would a cat or a dog. So what does this mean? Well, basically any animal, including yourselves, who go for surgery, being placed under anesthesia, there's a certain list of criteria that you have to kind of meet where you know that, you know, you're not responding to anything, but you're not so deep where your body is shutting down. So for fish, the really great way to tell if they are properly anesthetized is if they are still respirating. So fish have a per well, most fish have an operculum over their gills. Um, fish are kind of pump ventilators. So open their mouth, take in some water, close their mouth, push water out through their gills. And that movement kind of does this little respiratory movement here on their gills. So if they're breathing on their own, great. If they're not, not really a big deal for fish. Um, we'll actually put a Doppler on their heart, um, or you can do an ultrasound and we can see their heart beating pretty much throughout the surgery. And then what we'll do usually is have some pre, pre-op drugs. So this might be some lidocaine to kind of numb up the incision site. It might be some antibiotics. It might be some NSAIDs like meloxicam. But a fish really shouldn't react to me poking them with a needle or say removing scales from our incision site. So again, respiratory movement, heart rate, not responding to any pain stimuli, we are good to go for surgery. And then depending on the procedure, say we might be taking an eyeball out, we might just be removing a lump, we might be opening up the salomic cavity to say look for a tumor or a foreign body. Um, basically it's gonna proceed pretty much the same as any other small animal surgery. Um, with the eye procedures, you know, fish don't really have eyelids, so there's nothing to close. Um, eyeball removals are some of my favorite surgeries to do. Uh, usually we do them in cases of severe tumor growth in koi and goldfish specifically. But again, we're not closing anything. And as long as the water is clean and they're eating, those fish heal up remarkably well. It's really amazing to see a fish, you know, a couple weeks past surgery and it's like there was never an eye there. For the open salomic surgeries. So these we usually do for koi that has a tumor. Um, I used to do these a lot more before I got more proficient with my ultrasound. So with any koi that looks distended in the belly region, um, can be a couple different causes. Could just be fluid accumulation, such as if they have a kidney infection. Um, a lot of the times it is a cancerous growth. But by the time it's actually apparent on the outside, it's over 50% of the fish's internal body cavity. And if it's more than 50%, you know, crushing their other organs, surgery might not be the best idea. If it's small, and we've caught a couple that are small, basically I'm gonna open the salomic cavity and go find that tumor and peel it out with my fingers. Don't really have anything to tie off. Um, fish during surgery really don't bleed. That much, it's just the way their vascular structures are set out. Again, I'm not going after spleens or anything with big blood flow, but a lot of these tumors tend to have very tiny vascular structures. Um, if they do have any large ones, usually we can see them and ligate them. But again, once the tumor's out, we're going to stitch them back up and then come out a couple weeks later, take the stitches out. Again, same cat or dog, and they'll go about their lives. So yes, absolutely. Fish can undergo surgery. On our YouTube channel here, we have a bunch of different procedures. So if you're interested in learning more about fish surgery, um, please feel free to take a look at those videos. All right, Becky C asked, what is your favorite fish to work on? So yeah, um, being in pet fish, there's really only three species that we see consistently. And that is koi, goldfish, and betta fish see a little bit of salt water, some tetras, some other fresh water, some cichlids, but really koi, goldfish, betta fish, it's about 99% of what I see. Um, of those three that I see, I think the koi are my favorite, just because they're a lot 
bigger and you have more options when you're working on them compared to a little tiny beta fish, which unfortunately it's really hard to do a good exam on them just given their size. Um, they get stressed out super easily. So a lot of those exams for them are actually just going to be visual goldfish comets all the way. Love long bodied comet goldfish. Those fancy goldfish drive me up a wall. Yes, they are very cute. They're very, you know, intricately colored and patterned, but they are structural monstrosities. I mean, you take a fish like this and you squish it like this. Obviously you're probably going to have some structural issues and problems with life. So I am happiest with koi all the way. Again, you just have more body to work with. You can do, you know, enucleations. You can do the open salomic procedures. You can do cryos. You can do blood tests. It's just a lot more fish to work with. So I hate saying it, but I do love working on those koi. And it is 85% of my practice. So I get a lot of practice with those as well. All right. Um, and this question was asked again a couple of times. As a fish owner, what can I do to give my fish a good life? So that is really the primary reason that I'm here, that I am a fish veterinarian, that I am trying to spread the word that there are fish veterinarians to help any kind of fish in the world, being it for aquaculture, for an aquarium, for pet fish. So when it comes to fish health, the two most important things that you can do is to maintain your water chemistry, like we had the question about earlier, and feed a good diet. Now, water chemistry might be a couple different things depending on the species that you are taking care of. Again, for those three pets, fish species, koi, goldfish, betas, their water quality is fairly similar. Um, you know, the goldfish and koi um, are poi kilo ectotherms, so they can tolerate a wide range of temperatures. Beta fish, on the other hand, are stanophiles. They have a very narrow temperature range. So when it comes to keeping your beta fish healthy, a filter and a heater go a long, long way. And unfortunately, it's a, something that a lot of fish keepers are completely ignorant of. Because, you know, you see beta fish on Instagram, on the internet, in a vase or a little bowl of water with maybe like one plant. Um, if you keep them in a tank that is filtered with a heater and you're actually, you know, checking the water chemistry like this lovely person is, that goes a really long way in making sure that they're going to have a long and happy life. So again, goldfish, koi, these are big carp. Um, they need a lot of room and they're really not the most efficient feed to mass converters. So that means they eat a lot and they poop a lot and release ammonia. They're not really keying but they're gonna produce a lot of waste. So you need a lot of room. For goldfish, you're gonna be starting with about 20 gallons per fish, which I know sounds ridiculous to much owners, but it will go a long way in making sure that your goldfish can survive into their 20s, which they are certainly capable of doing. With koi, you're looking at about 250 gallons per fish. And if you have any large breeding females, she's gonna need at least 500 gallons to herself. So I'm sure some of you are sitting there in horror calculating your volume and fish and realizing, you know, my pond or tank is probably a little overstocked. No worries. It happens. Um, really what you have to do then is just keep an eye on your water chemistry. And that means testing regularly with a test kit and please write down your results so you can kind of notice when trends go one way or another. And that will kind of kind of tell you that there's something that you need to fix. And then diet. So just like pet foods across the board, it really comes down to marketing. And it's hard to ignore the marketing. Some people will just take, okay, this is the most expensive fish food. It must be the best. When eh, really it probably isn't. Um, this is pretty much the case with all koi foods. Um, the koi food that we recommend, um, it's made here in California. They have a nutritionist on staff, which is pretty much unheard of for a lot of fish food companies. Um, and it's very reasonably priced. Um, it's probably the mid-range of all the fish foods. They have good ingredients. They know what they're doing. They have research. They do other commercial diets. So again, price point, absolutely no merit on how good a food is. And again, there's trends on, you know, having organic foods, having 
no corn, low protein, which is ridiculous for fish. Um, so it really comes down to just reading that ingredient label, which can take some time. You might have to look up some, you know, scientific terms on your phone. But if you do your research, you can really kind of pick the best diet for your fish. Now, that might not be the best diet for your neighbor's fish that keeps the same species and kind of the same setup. But what's the best for your fish? So ignore what everybody else says. Um, we do have another YouTube webinar that is all about reading fish food labels. And we have other resources on our website if you're interested in taking any particular diets and kind of breaking them down. Um, we also have recommendations for koi, that is, and goldfish. Again, just what we see in the commercial market. None of them are ideal. Um, it's a little frustrating for me. Um, I'd love to develop my own fish food in the future, but for now, this is what we have to go by. So with that, that is all the questions that were submitted. Um, does anyone else have any other questions while we are hanging out? Um, like I said, we have the link for additional questions. If you're interested up at the top of the chat, um, this is open 24 seven. Um, if I can't get back to you right away, I apologize. I do not get to my emails as fast as I would like because I'm out driving around seeing clients all the time. So if you absolutely have to have your fish quest, questions answered, please call our office directly. Um, you can reach us at 866-FISH-VET. Um, this is good for both our Northern and Southern California office. Um, and we're hopefully going to be having a couple more veterinarians all over the country join us this next year. So thank you so much for everyone who attended our first live session. Um, hopefully you're able to hear me okay and the lag wasn't too bad. Um, I know my my lovely office background um, will need to be improved. <laughs> That's the best we have for right now. So thank you so much, everyone who attended. And if you have any more questions, you know where to find us. So best fishes and happy new year to you all. And thank you so much for joining us today.